A la Tulia Meldonia, Ahara Mariese, and welcome to our third episode, discussing some of the changes and differences between Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings movies and Professor Tolkien's Legendarium. So in this video, I'm going to finally talk about Frodo's departure from Hobbiton, his journey through the Shire, and the first leg of his great adventure. So this part of the movies is very concisely told, and we see Frodo and Sam, they begin walking through a cornfield, and they bump into Merry and Pippin, they're chased off a cliff by Farmer Maggot, and then they encounter a black rider, and then they seem to be kind of chased around by black riders for like an evening, I guess, uh, before jumping on the Buckleberry Ferry, and then it's kind of implied on the other side of that river is Bree, right? And there is also a scene in the extended edition where Frodo and Sam encounter a bunch of wandering elves. But the whole thing from leaving Bag End to arriving in Bree only takes about 15 minutes of screen time. But as is kind of becoming a running theme in these videos, in the book there is so much more to talk about, and this leg of the journey includes some of the weirdest and coolest little details in the entire Legendarium. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, all the crazy things that Frodo encounters on his way to Bree. Now in the last video we talked about how much slower everything is in the book, and even though Gandalf comes and tells Frodo the truth about the ring in April, Frodo doesn't actually leave home until his 50th birthday five months later. And the main reason for this delay is that Gandalf actually told Frodo not to depart until Gandalf came back, and then they could all leave together and Gandalf could hopefully protect Frodo as he begins his perilous journey. But this is not what happens. As we know from last video and also the movies, Gandalf is delayed by Saruman's shenanigans. And by the time that summer has turned into autumn, Frodo realizes that Gandalf isn't coming, and he's going to have to begin this journey on his own. But I do have to say, Frodo's not exactly been entirely idle during his last summer in the Shire, because in the book there is much more of an emphasis on secrecy, which the hobbits are not great at in the movie. And to be fair, they're not like amazing at it in the book either, but they do at least try. So instead of just setting out into a cornfield with Sam, Frodo first puts Bag End up for sale, and he buys another hobbit hole in a wild little village to the east of the Shire called Crick Hollow. Now he does this in order to make his departure a lot less sudden, and to provide an alibi for why he's going away. And the person that Frodo actually sells Bag End to is, of all people, Lobelia Sackville Baggins, the nemesis of his uncle Bilbo. So Frodo's last day as a gentle hobbit of leisure is his 50th birthday. And when the day after that comes and Gandalf still hasn't arrived, Frodo realizes he's going to have to leave Hobbiton without the wizard's help. So he does what I guess most of us do when we move house. He gets two of his friends to help with the heavy lifting. And these two friends are Merry Adoc Brandybuck and a lesser known character called Fredegar Bolger. Now, Fredegar Bolger, or Fatty Bolger, as he's very unflatteringly known as, is completely cut from the movies. He only has the briefest cameo during Bilbo's party. But in the book, Fatty Bolger is actually the fifth hobbit, and he plays a relatively important role in the first leg of Frodo's journey. Now, it's interesting because in Tolkien's earliest drafts of Lord of the Rings, Fatty Bolger was originally going to be a much more important character, and he was originally supposed to accompany the Hobbits all the way on their journey to Rivendell. But as we know, this was cut before the book was published. Although, there is one tiny little detail that made it through in the Old Forest chapter. Because Tolkien describes the Hobbits as preparing five ponies, even though there are only four of them. I guess this fifth was meant to be for Fatty Bolger. 
But anyway, Fatty and Merry go off ahead and they drive all Frodo's belongings to Crick Hollow and they begin to set up his house for him so it'll all be ready when he eventually gets there. Now, there is one particularly important change between the movies and the book that I do really feel I have to talk about. But it's not really a change of story, it's more a change in character. Because in the movies, Frodo is certainly portrayed as being the youngest member of the Fellowship, right? I mean, Elijah Wood, I think, was like 17 when he was cast. And I mean, the first movie made like $800 million or something absurd, so it's hard to argue that they didn't cast the right person as Frodo, but they certainly didn't cast him as Tolkien envisioned the character. So I've already said that Frodo at this point in the books is 50 which by Hobbit standards makes him middle-aged. And in the book, Frodo certainly acts his age. You know, he's the wisest of the four Hobbits, he's the most sensible of the four, and he's the bravest, and he really is the leader of their little group. And so, in the book, Frodo's departure from the Shire feels a lot more like a sacrifice. Because instead of being a wide-eyed youth who yearns for adventure, Frodo is a very well-to-do, well-respected, well-established hobbit who is living an incredibly comfortable life in Bag End. So his starting point in the story is very different in the book compared to the movies. And this one change to Frodo also quite remarkably affects the characters of the other three Fellowship Hobbits. For example, in the movie, Sam is quite clearly older than Frodo, and he kind of has this, like, well, not quite father figure, but like, kind of like older brother relationship with the ring bearer. But that's not the case in the book at all. Sam is considerably younger than Frodo, he is Frodo's manservant, and at the beginning of the story, Sam has zero knowledge of the world, he has zero experience, he has zero wisdom, that is all Frodo's wheelhouse. But as the story develops and continues, Sam becomes a more and more confident, a more self-realized, and eventually a chiefly heroic character who is able to pick up his master's burden after Frodo falls in the Pass of Kirithungal. It's a subtle change, but I do think having Sam be younger than Frodo does significantly affect his character. And furthermore, it significantly affects the character of Pippin. Because if in the movie Frodo is the youngest hobbit, that means Pippin is not the youngest hobbit. And in Tolkien's writing, Pippin is very much the youngest hobbit. In the book, we are told he is 28, which I guess doesn't sound that young. But don't forget that hobbits don't come of age, they don't become adults until they're 33. So 28-year-old Pippin is basically the Hobbit equivalent of a teenager. And this is very important to Pippin's character because we see that he is the most naive, he is in some ways the most foolish, I guess, but that's because he's the youngest and he's totally out of his depth. You see, Pippin is the youngest child of the Thane of the Shire. Pippin's dad is effectively the King of Hobbits, although Hobbits don't have anywhere near that much of a centralized power structure. But Tooks are a very, very upper class family of Hobbits, and so Pippin has been raised in this incredibly privileged lifestyle. Which is really interesting to hold in our minds as we kind of see how Pippin's story progresses over the course of The Lord of the Rings. And of course, by changing Pippin in the movie, this affects Merry. Because in the movie, well, certainly in the first movie, in Fellowship of the Ring, Pippin and Merry do pretty much everything together. You know, they're introduced together, they join the Fellowship together, and then they are eventually captured by Urukai together. And these things do happen in the book too, but Tolkien does make a very clear distinction between Pippin's character and Merry's character. You see, Merry is in some ways very different from the other three main hobbits. I mean, Technically, he's not even from the Shire. Merry lives in a little region called Buckland, which lies beyond the borders of the Shire, and it's kind of like its own little tiny independent nation of hobbits that lies between the Brandywine River and the Old Forest. 
And the people of Buckland are very different from the kind of stereotypical Shire Hobbit. The Hobbits of Buckland are what's called Fallowhide Hobbits. And Fallowhides are a little bit taller, a little bit wilder, and a lot more adventurous. At least, you know, by Hobbit standards. And Merry's family are the rulers of these Fallowhides of Buckland. So Tolkien demonstrates that Merry is a lot more daring than the average Hobbit. And he's probably the cleverest and certainly the wiliest of our four Hobbit heroes. Now, I wanted to flag this up because although the movies do do a really good job at differentiating the four hobbits over the course of the trilogy, in the books, Tolkien distinguishes their separate personalities right from the get-go, right from the very beginning. Anyway, I think that's really important. But I guess we've got to continue on with the story, don't we? And so, the day after Frodo's 50th birthday, he sets off for Crick Hollow with his rich young second cousin, Peregrine Took, and his manservant, Samwise Gamgee. Again, not his friend, his manservant, his gardener. Now, Tolkien actually makes quite an important distinction between the upper-class wealthy Hobbit families that both Frodo and Pippin belong to, and the poorer working-class Hobbits, like Sam. And I think this is quite illuminating of Tolkien's own experiences. Because, don't forget, before writing this story, Tolkien was an officer in the First World War, and he would have seen firsthand the very close relationships that were built between the gentlemen officers and their working class servants, who were known in the trenches as Batmen. Now, unfortunately, this has nothing to do with, like, Batman, that would be cool, but it's very likely that Tolkien based Frodo and Sam's friendship on these officer Batman relationships, which he would most certainly have experienced firsthand. Anyway, Frodo, Sam, and Pippin leave Hobbiton just like in the movies, except that Merry is not with them at this point. Remember, he is off in Crick Hollow with Fatty Bulger and all of Frodo's belongings. And I do just need to take one moment to talk about the size of the Shire. Like, if I showed you these scenes and said, where did these take place? Most people, I guess, would say, oh, they take place in the Shire. And you're not wrong, they do take place in the Shire, but more specifically, they all take place in Hobbiton. This is Hobbiton, just one village of many in the vast nation that is the Shire. So, Tolkien actually tells us that the Shire is 20,000 square miles. I mean, 20,000 square Numenorean miles, which is technically a little bit more than 20,000 miles. And just to give you guys a little bit of perspective, in our world, on our planet Earth, there are 71 countries that are smaller than the Shire. So imagine having to walk all the way across Denmark, or Switzerland, or the Netherlands. That's the kind of size that we're dealing with when we talk about the Shire. It's not just a couple of hobbit holes in a field. So even walking to Crick Hollow is, in and of itself, a bit of an adventure. But anyway, it is at this point in their adventure that the hobbits encounter their first Black Rider. And just like in the movie, Frodo suggests they get off the road. Although none of them know that this rider is a servant of the enemy, and when they first hear the sound of hooves, they actually assume it must be Gandalf. And Frodo suggests they hide so they can jump out and surprise him. Now, we know this rider is obviously not Gandalf, and it is a very good thing that Frodo did decide to hide, otherwise the whole Lord of the Rings would be a hell of a lot shorter. So, just like in the movies, Frodo feels this overwhelming urge to put on the ring. But, unlike in the movies, the Black Rider does not stick around, and fortunately, he soon rides off down the road. Now, the Hobbits are obviously a little shaken by this, but not quite as much as in the movie, because in the book it is, of all people, Samwise Gamgee who knows what's going on. You see, in the book, this exact Black Rider, whose name is Kamul the Easterling, by the way, has already met Sam's dad, Gaffer Gamgee. And he asked the old hobbit about one Mr. Baggins of Bag End. 
But luckily for Frodo, the gaffer does not tell Kamul very much at all. And when the rider asks why Baggins is no longer living in Bag End, the gaffer replies that why is none of my business or yours? Which is a pretty badass thing for a hobbit to say to, you know, the second in command of the Nazgul. Anyway, before long, the hobbits encounter another Black Rider, but luckily this time, this one is chased off by the sound of elven singing. You see, the hobbits stumble across a group of wandering elves, and they are led by one Gilador Inglorion, who has the pretty neat distinction of being the first named elven character in the entire Lord of the Rings. Now, Gildor in Glorion is hardly the most important character that I'm going to talk about, but there is one cool little detail about his name. You see, Gildor in Glorion, what that means is Gildor, son of Inglor. Eon just means son of. But nowhere in Tolkien's legendarium is there any reference to any elf called Inglor. But that wasn't always the case. You see, way back when Tolkien was writing his earliest notes on what would eventually become the Silmarillion, the character that we now call Finrod, that's the brother of Galadriel and the son of the Noldor Prince Finarfin, his name was originally, in the earliest drafts, Inglor. Now, long before the Silmarillion was published, Tolkien changed Inglor's name to Finrod, and that is how he is known, and all references to Inglor were deleted from the Legendarium, except for Gildor Inglorion. Now, I am not trying to suggest that this character is really the grandson of Finarfin or the nephew of Galadriel or anything like that, but it's possible that at one point in his process, Tolkien might have considered it. I guess we'll never know, but it's quite an interesting little detail. Anyway, once the hobbits bid Gildor and his elves farewell, they continue their journey until they eventually arrive at a farm called Bam Furlong, which belongs to a farmer called Farmer Maggot. Now, in the movies, Farmer Maggot does have a very brief cameo, and he's kind of portrayed as a bit of an antagonist, to be honest. But in the book, Farmer Maggot is a really good dude, and he takes the hobbits in, he gives them shelter and he gives them food, and he too reveals that he had been approached by a black rider who'd come asking about Baggins. So Farmer Maggot proves himself a very helpful character, and under the cover of night, in the pitch black amongst thick fog, Farmer Maggot loads up his cart and drives the hobbits all the way to the Buckleberry Ferry. However, on the road, they once again hear the sound of a rider approaching, and they assume it must be another one of these black horsemen. But it isn't. This time, the rider has a familiar face, and Tolkien soon reveals that this rider is none other than Mary Adoc Brandybuck, who'd come all the way from Crick Hollow looking for his friends. So, Merry ferries Frodo, Sam, and Pippin across the river, and at this point in the movie, they arrive in Bree. But Bree is still miles and miles away. Instead, in the book, they arrive in Buckland, and they soon arrive at Frodo's new home in Crick Hollow. Now, at this point in the story, Frodo hasn't told anyone about the true nature of his quest and he believes that Sam is the only one with any idea about the ring or Sauron. But this is not the case. And there's actually a lovely little scene in the book where the hobbits reveal they know there's a lot more going on that Frodo's not telling them. You see, in the book, Merry is a very bright young hobbit. And years ago, when he was just a child, he accidentally happened to witness Bilbo slipping on his magical ring to avoid a meeting with the Sackville Bagginses. And Merry just kind of lived with this knowledge. He knew something was up, and he became very curious about Bilbo's ring. In fact, Merry actually recruited Pippin, Sam, and Fatty Bulger to help him figure out what was going on. 
And that is actually the reason that Mary's chief conspirator, Samwise Gamgee, was eavesdropping that night when Gandalf caught him. You see, it was Mary's plan to help Frodo in his quest without Frodo even knowing that he knew. Which I just kind of think is hilarious, and it makes me really like Mary. I just love the idea that Frodo has this big secret to share, but Mary already knows, and so does everyone else, because Mary has already recruited them to unmask this conspiracy. Anyway, it's at this point that the quest really begins to get underway. Because Merry insists on going with Frodo, Sam, and Pippin. But he suggests that instead of travelling along the road, they instead venture into the Old Forest, which lies on the eastern border of Buckland. So, this is what they do, but Fatty Bolger does not go with them. Instead, he stays at Crick Hollow, and basically he just pretends to be Frodo Baggins in order to keep up appearances and convince the wider world that Frodo is still kicking around just outside the Shire. Now, despite this next part of the story being completely cut from the movies, I reckon most of you guys will be familiar with the Old Forest, the Barrow Downs, and of course, Tom Bombadil. So first up is the Old Forest, and this is the first place the hobbits go to that is considered true wilderness. And so this is a big deal, because with the exception of Merry, none of the others have ever been this far from home. And the Old Forest is filled with all kinds of dangerous beings. And the most dangerous of them all, at least that the hobbits encounter, is Old Man Willow, who's like a, an evil huorn, not quite an ent, but a lot more than just a tree. So Old Man Willow traps the hobbits and he almost kills them, which is mad considering how early on in the quest they are. But the hobbits are of course rescued by the one and only Tom Bombadil. Now, there is nowhere near enough time in this video for me to talk all about Tom. I don't know, maybe I'll make a video about him some other day. But what you need to know right now is that Tom is one of the most enigmatic characters in the entire Legendarium. Now, obviously, this whole Old Man Willow thing is not in the movie. But there is a very similar moment in an extended scene of the Two Towers, where Merry and Pippin get trapped by a tree in Fangorn Forest. And instead of being rescued by Tom Bombadil, they're rescued by Treebeard, who actually uses some of Tom Bombadil's exact dialogue in this scene. You should not be waiting. Eat Earth, Dink. Anyway, after being rescued by Tom, the hobbits are taken back to his home and they meet Tom's wife, the equally mysterious Goldberry. And it's in this scene that Tom demonstrates why he is such a weird character. You see, Frodo tells him all about the ring and he even offers the ring to Tom. And Tom takes it. And Tom puts it on his finger, and nothing happens. He doesn't turn invisible, he isn't corrupted, he doesn't seem to demonstrate any desire to keep the ring. He just takes it off and gives it back. Which is bizarre, because remember, powerful characters like Galadriel and Gandalf are terrified of touching the ring. They're terrified of being corrupted by it, and yet it has no effect on Tom which makes him the most enigmatic character in <laughs> the entire Legendarium. His immunity to the ring is bewildering. Anyway, the last main thing I'm going to talk about in this video is what the hobbits get up to when they leave the house of Tom Bombadil. Because there is now only one location between them and Bree, and it is of course the haunted hills known as the Barrow Downs. And this is one of the creepiest places in all of Middle-earth. So, the hobbits set off into the fog, and they soon find themselves in an area of land that once belonged to the lost kingdom of Arnor, where Aragorn's ancestors were once kings, going all the way back to Elendil and Isildur. But the Barrow Downs are now an evil place. Because a few thousand years ago, Arnor was attacked 
by the Witch King of Angmar. And the Witch King infected this land with evil spirits that come to haunt the ancient burial ground. Now these evil spirits are of course the Barrow Whites, and they're pretty terrifying at the best of times, but just to make matters that little bit worse, only a few days before Frodo and the Hobbits arrived at the Barrow Downs, the Black Riders had been there, searching for the ring. And their captain, the Lord of the Nazgul, who we know is the Witch King of Angmar, roused the Barrow Whites while he was there, and that made them even more dangerous. So, surprise, surprise, it's not long before the hobbits are captured, and Frodo is actually the only one who is able to remain conscious. And in this scene, we see some incredible bravery from Frodo, and he actually takes up a sword and cleaves off the Barrow White's arm. And I'll talk about this in more detail in the next video, but Book Frodo is so much more courageous and so much less, I don't want to say useless, say passive, he's so much less passive than he is in the movies. Now, I don't really have time to get too much into the specifics here, but the Hobbits are once again saved from the Barrow Whites by Tom Bombadil. And after this, Tom does kind of disappear from the story. But before he does, he has one last very important thing to do. You see, he gives to the four hobbits four blades, four daggers, that were forged by the men of Numenor. Now we've not talked about Numenor yet, and you don't need to worry about Numenor right now, but what matters about these blades is that they were forged by some of the most powerful enemies of the Dark Lord, and that power can still be found within them. So obviously in Rivendell, we all know Frodo upgrades his sword to Sting, but the other three hobbits keep their barrow blades for the rest of the story. And this is particularly important in the case of Merry. You see, if we fast forward about six months, we'll find ourselves at the Battle of Pelennor Fields. And of course, Merry fights in this battle, and he fights with his barrow blade. And he uses this barrow blade to stab the Witch King of Angmar. And because Merry was armed with a weapon of Sauron's mightiest enemies, the dagger is able to break the spell that knits the Witch King's unseen sinews to his will. So what that basically means is that Merry's barrow blade is the reason that Eowyn is eventually able to kill the Witch King, and so the 3,000 year old kingdom of Arnor, the kingdom of Elendil and Isildur, is finally avenged by one hobbit from the Shire and one shield maiden from Rohan. It's an insanely cool detail. But anyway, that is where I'm going to end this video, because as soon as the hobbits leave the Barrow Downs, they immediately come within sight of the village of Bree. And that is where I'm going to pick up in the next video and continue the story of meeting Strider, the journey to Weathertop, and of course, the climactic flight to the Ford, which ends the first book in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. So to make sure you don't miss that, hit subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaeh Melanine.